Well, it's 12.03. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming today. My name is Renee Miller. I'm the Associate Director at the Oregon Bioscience Incubator. And welcome to this Lunch and Learn on Best Practices for FDA Submissions. Um, so while we get settled, here's just a couple of housekeeping items. Please uh, put yourself on mute so we don't get interrupted and just remain on mute until the end when we go through the Q&A portion. Um, if you have any questions for the presenters, please type them in the chat and then we'll get to them at the end. And feel free to introduce yourself in the chat so we can know who's here and connect with one another. It's part of us being a great part of the community is the ability to connect like this. Otradi would like to acknowledge the land we're all on, wherever we may be. Otradi conducts business throughout Portland and beyond and is making an effort to acknowledge the history of the area and work toward decolonization of the bioscience industry. Portland rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who have made their homes along the Columbia River. So please join us in acknowledging the land we're all on throughout Portland and beyond. To learn more about Portland's native, diverse, and vibrant community, please read Leading with Tradition, a document created by the Portland Indian Leaders Roundtable. And there will be a link to it in the chat. So we're very pleased to introduce our presenters today. Um, in this Lunch and Learn, you're going to learn about the basics of working with the FDA for medical device companies, including information on pre-submissions, device classes, and classifying your device. There's a lot to cover on this topic, so we'll go ahead and get started with introductions. First off, I'd like to introduce Kristen Mittal. She's the owner of, Chris, of Mittal Consulting. Kristen is an accomplished regulatory affairs professional with extensive expertise at class one, two, and three medical device companies from startups to fortune 500 companies with a specialty in electromagnetic and implantable devices. She started Mittal Consulting in the middle of the pandemic after noticing a widespread need in the world of regulatory services for these emerging medical device companies and incubator programs. Built by entrepreneurs with entrepreneurs in mind, Mittal Consulting came to about to empower small medical device manufacturers with seamless regulatory consulting services, especially with the FDA. And Madrol Mittal. As Director of Marketing and Business Development at Mittal Consulting, he joined the company recently with a goal to grow and expand the company worldwide. Working at different government organizations, private corporations, consulting firms, and engaging with regulatory bodies, he brings a unique perspective in product marketing and spatial marketing. His expertise includes business development, brand creations, digital marketing, and account management. Welcome to both of you, and thank you for being here. Great, Renee, thank you so much for having us. We're really happy to be here. We're pleased to have you with us. So please, the floor is yours. Um, you can share your screen, take it away, and we look forward to hearing about FDA uh, submissions. Okay, great. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Can you all see it? Okay, wonderful. All right, well, great to be here. We're really happy um, to be able to present um, at a high level on FDA submissions, um, specifically for early stage startups. Um, probably this won't go answer all your questions, but at least some of them. Uh, we'll leave plenty of time at the end to answer them as well. Um, so with that, I will go over the agenda. Um, so for today's webinar, we're going to start um, at a high overview of the FDA. Um, so kind of go over the structure um, and then we'll go over at a high level um, FDA medical device classifications um, and submission types, um, just to give you a familiarity with some of the different terms. Um, then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking specifically about one type of FDA submission which is a pre-submission, 
Um, and we're specifically going to focus on this type of submission today because it's likely the uh, first type of submission that you'll do with the FDA. Um, these generally are the first ones that lead to other types of submissions subsequently. After that, Murdul will take over and he'll talk about FDA guidance documents, best practices for interacting with the FDA, um, and then give some general advice for early stage companies that we've seen um, from running this business. Um, we have kind of a short presentation and left quite a bit of time for questions at the end, because um, as you know, this is a dense topic and uh, we'll be looking forward um, to answering any questions at the end that you do have. All right, so here I put on the screen um, a diagram of the current FDA structure. Um, so the FDA has been around for more than 100 years, um, and their purpose is to protect the consumers of the United States. So it was initially established in 1906, and over the years, it has slowly and methodically been built up to the structure that it is you can see here today. So in this diagram, you can see there are six different centers, um, and these are also the review branches, another word for review branch at the FDA. Um, so the six different centers are Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, Center for Devices and Radiological Health, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, Center for Tobacco Products, and Center for Veterinary Medicine. So the closest three branches to our heart would be the Biologics, Devices, and Drug branches, with the closest being Center for Di Devices and Radiological Health, uh, because we specialize in medical devices. So most medical device submissions will go to CDRH. Um, please keep in mind though, if you have a drug device combination product, it will likely be go to and be reviewed by both branches, so both the device and the drug branch. Likewise, if you have um, an in vitro diagnostic, it will likely be reviewed by the biologic branch as well. Um, so this is kind of a very high level, so you can see the oversight that the FDA has currently. All right, let's move a little deeper into the medical device classification. So in the US, there are three different classes of medical devices. They are class one, class two, and class three. I'm gonna go ahead and get my pointer here so I can uh, show you a little bit. So these three classes here are um, separated by risk level. So class one would be your lowest risk class devices, and class three would be your highest risk devices, like implantable life-sustaining devices. So first I'll go through each of these classes so you can get a little bit idea about them. So class one devices are very low risk devices and usually they're exempt from having to submit a 510K submission. However, um, as with all classes of devices, you can see um, general controls still apply. So types of class one devices would be like bandages, latex gloves, surgical masks, stethoscopes. There's a wide range um, that I'm sure you could probably think of. Now, in terms of the percentage of FDA reviews, FDA, um, about 10% of the FDA reviews are for class one devices. Um, and this is usually for the ones that require 510Ks. Um, but while only 5% of reviews, FDA reviews are class one, um, keep in mind that about 50% of the U.S. market of medical devices um, is made of class one devices. So they're very prevalent. All right, let's move on to class two devices. So class two are in general your medium risk devices. Um, and usually, but not always, they require a 510K submission. So examples of class two devices would be catheters, contact lenses, electronic wheelchairs, and thermometers. So about 80% of the submissions that the FDA reviews are class two, and usually these are 510Ks. Um, so that gives you an idea of where the FDA is spending their time for the most part. And then finally, we'll move on to class three devices. So these are your highest risk devices. 
Um, and these are usually implantable and life-sustaining devices. Um, they are almost always, 99% of the time, subject to a pre-market approval, which is a very large, extensive application to prove both safety and effectiveness through a significant amount of testing. So examples of these type of devices would be implantable pacemakers and defibrillators, implantable prosthetics like breast implants or interocular lenses. These are things that you're going to want a lot of testing done and review done for to make sure that they're safe um, to go in the body. Um, all right. Now, I'm sure you're probably wondering what class does my device fall into? Um, so a great way to get started is to do a quick Google search. Just look and see if there's any um, comparable devices that are already on the market um, and see what class they fall into and see what submission pathway they took. So all of these FDA 5 and K and PMAs, they are, at least part of them, um, are online for review. So you can get a lot of um, great information just by doing a quick Google search to kind of get you started to see where you're at. Now, after that, you would want to have a regulatory person step in and really do a deep dive um, to see which class and which regulatory pathway are appropriate. Um, this is because there because devices are so different from each other, depending on where they are at in the body or what the type of indications for use is, um, they have very different risk levels um, and very different potential intended purposes. Um, so many devices um, on the surface may look like they belong in one class, um, but depending on how specific you want your indications for use to be, um, that can actually change which class and which um, submission pathway you need to do through the FDA. Um, so it's great to start thinking about that and then get with a regulatory affairs professional to really hone down and make sure you have um, a strong path forward and you know um, you're doing the right testing to be able to support uh, one of these applications. All right. Now let's get a little bit deeper. Let's go into the common types of FDA submissions. So on the previous slide, I talked a little bit about 510Ks and PMAs, and these are probably the most common types of submissions you're gonna run to and do for most generally class two and class three devices. Um, but as you can see in this blue box, this large blue box here, there's a lot of other types of submissions that you can do to the FDA as well. Um, some lesser common ones, um, but still very important ones are de novo submissions and humanitarian device exemption submissions. Um, so at a high level, a de novo submission um, is kind of between a 510K and a PMA. Um, it's also like a 510K, it's for a medium risk device. Um, however, if you've done a search and your device is medium risk, but you cannot find a predicate at all, um, you can do a de novo submission as opposed to a PMA. Um, and so this usually does require some sort of clinical study, though, because there's more, um, there's more need to prove you're doing less predicating on a previous device. You need to prove independently that your device is safe and effective. Um, so it also takes about a medium amount of work between a 510K and a PMA. It's definitely more work than a 510K. Um, but once you have a de novo out, everyone else can predicate or do a 510K off of your de novo. Um, so it, it makes it easier for device manufacturers going forward. Um, a humanitarian device exemption um, is usually an alternative to a PMA. Um, and this is a program that was created by the FDA um, for small population um, diseases or life-threatening diseases that may not have a financial incentive to have development for because there's no monetary benefit. The population is so small, um, but they still want to promote um, these life-saving devices for these very rare diseases. Um, so in this case, you can do a humanitarian device exemption uh, which is similar to a PMA, but you only have to prove efficacy. You don't, uh, sorry, you only have to prove um, safety. You don't have to prove efficacy. Um, so the burden of proof is slightly lower so that 
um, we can at least get more technologies like this on the market. Now, that's a lot of different words here, and there's even more types of types of 510Ks and types of supplements for PMA. Um, and you can definitely work with a regulatory person to work your way through all of this. Um, but kind of the take home message is, um, if you have a PMA, there's going to be a lot of ongoing maintenance um, after even after you've got your PMA approval, um, just for any manufacturing changes or any types of changes you want to make to the device along the way. Um, but before you can submit one of these, you have to do a lot of preparation. Um, that includes potentially clinical studies, um, verification, validation testing, the whole works, um, so that you can be sure that your device is safe and effective before you give it to patients. Um, and so in order, one part of the preparation um, that's really important and used quite often is called a pre-submission. Um, and the purpose of a pre-submission in general is to request feedback from the FDA um, regarding questions you have. Um, and this would be in advance of one of these submissions here or in advance of an IDE submission. Um, an IDE submission is an investigational device exemption, um, which is basically a request to be able to do a significant risk clinical study. So. I know that that's a mouthful for this slide. We'll go ahead um, and dive a little deeper into pre-submissions now, um, since you'll, this will be likely the first type of submission you do with the FDA. Um, so a pre-submission, also called a Q-submission or Q-sub. Um, Q-sub, uh, FDA really likes their acronym, so they push the Q-sub term hard. Um, it's a voluntary program. It was established back in 1995. Um, initially, it started out only to be used to answer questions in advance of an IDE or investigational device exemption submission. Um, however, throughout the years, both FDA and industry have found this program to be so useful um, that they have pretty much broadened the scope over the years to be used for pretty much any situation at any time point before, during, or after formal submissions with the FDA. Um, so they have a guidance document that lists all the potential scenarios, um, but in this webinar, we're just gonna talk about the general pre-submission. Um, so most companies, especially class three device companies, uh, will likely do several pre-submissions uh, with the FDA um, during the development for a given product. So the great thing is, is that you can use it multiple times um, throughout your design and development for different questions, different issues that come up. The other great thing is that um, this submission, unlike most other submissions to the FDA, has no cost associated with it. Um, this is likely because, like I said, both the FDA and um, industry have found this program so useful um, that they don't want the cost to be a prohibitive factor um, in being able to get the advice that the company needs and have the questions answered um, in a timely manner. All right, now that that's kind of a high level, let's get into the nitty gritty of what is in a pre-submission. So a pre-submission in itself is a formal written request um, that you put together and submit um, in to request feedback from the FDA. So at a high level, it includes your purpose. Um, so the purpose would be what type of submission are you eventually trying to do? Is it a 510K, an IDE, um, what, what have you? Um, additionally, of course, your questions. So what are your very specific questions that you want feedback from the FDA for um, that are not addressed in a guidance document already? Um, it also includes um, a description of your device and your proposed indications for use or intended use. Um, and so these, I like when I, when I tell clients, I like them to think that this is likely the first time that the FDA is hearing about your device. It's probably new, it's novel. Um, they don't know much about it. So it's in your best interest to provide as much detail as you can about where you're at um, and describe it in a clear and concise manner so that they understand, they really understand what you're doing, where you're at, how the device works, 
Um, that way they can give you really good feedback. Um, and you have to remember that these applications are confidential. Um, so it's in your best interest to be as descriptive and clear as possible. Um, I've also listed on here, um, so if they're irrelevant, some other things you might wanna include in your pre-submission as well, um, like the types of testing you've performed or plan to perform, summary of clinical information if it's already available, um, discussion of compliance with special controls, um, and if applicable, if you already have it set up, the manufacturing process description. Um, so depending on the types of questions you're asking, um, you would include these types of sections um, with your application accordingly. Um, the more uh, relevant information you can give them, the better conversations and feedback you can get from them. All right, now that we've kind of discussed what goes into a pre-submission, I can give you a kind of overview of what the timeline looks. So after you've put your pre-submission together and you've sent it to the FDA, there's several little um, steps that happen along the way with the FDA. Um, so first, the FDA will accept it. Um, then if you're, you would like to do a teleconfer teleconference meeting, um, which we highly recommend you at least request, um, they'll put a meeting date on the calendar. Um, they will review the submission and then provide written feedback. Now for each type of um, pre-submission um, version, um, the FDA has different set timelines for a review. For the general pre-submission type that we're talking about, um, the review time is 70 to 75 calendar days. So when FDA talks about days, it's always in calendar days, not business days. And so within this time frame, you'll receive the written feedback to your questions from the FDA. And additionally, if you've requested it, um, there will also be a meeting happening within a couple days after you receive the written feedback, um, but within this time window. Now, um, if you decide to have the meeting, um, then it's highly encouraged that you do a significant amount of preparation before you actually have the meeting with the FDA. Um, so first, you should make sure that even if you've requested it, whether you still need to have it. You only need to have the meeting if the written feedback that you've received, um, you still are unclear about some of it. So you need some clarification. You need um, a little bit more understanding on maybe one or two of the responses. Um, so in that case, it's appropriate to have this meeting. Um, and you should have um, prepared in advance exactly the aspects that you want to discuss regarding the written feedback um, and have it in order of priority. Because remember, you only get uh, maximum of one hour to discuss with them. And of course, do dry runs, make sure you have the right people in the meeting um, to be able to talk, um, the correct subject matter experts on each of the questions um, and that they can talk an appropriate level. Um, of course, don't bring up topics that are outside of the scope of the questions. Um, that's not appropriate to have in these meetings. You really just want to drill in and make sure everyone's on the same page for the questions that you brought up. Um, after you have the meeting, of course, your regulatory person will send meeting minutes back to the FDA for the record. Um, please keep in mind um, that the, the decisions that are come to during these written feedback and meetings um, are non-binding. So while they will go in the record and you can use them to support applications coming down the line, like a 510K or PMA, um, you're also not set in stone to them either. Um, and that's a, a common misconception we see a lot is um, the hesitancy to do a pre-submission because of this. But it's not so um, because you, are, you still have the right um, to discuss one thing with the FDA during the meeting. Um, and then as you learn more information or do more testing, follow a different path um, for your approval. Um, and that's okay, so long as you support it with a good sound um, scientific rationale. Um, so that's good to keep in mind. All right, now I'm gonna hand it over to my partner Myrtle and he will um, take you through to the end of the presentation. All right, thank you, Kristen. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Hope you guys see it. There you go. 
All right. Well, thank you, Christian, for talking about device classes and pre-submissions and timeline. My name is Mridol Mittal, and I'm the co-founder and marketing officer here at Mittal Consulting. And right now, I'll be talking about the FDA guidances, and in particular, the pre-submission guidance. So as you can see on the slide, you know, this is a queue submission or a pre-submission guidance uh, document front page. Now, FDA has a trove of guidance documents online. All FDA guidances are easy to Google and you can easily search them online and they are well uh, filtered uh, so you can get to the right result. Uh, now, it's a great time that we're having this presentation right now because the FDA recently came out with an updated guidance document, especially for pre-submissions or Q-submissions shown here. Uh, in the blue here, you can see the link where you can download this document. It's the www.fda.gov slash media slash 114034 slash download. And uh, I would say, you know, if I'd like to learn more, this is a great resource to check out after this presentation of how to request feedback. Uh, for meetings for the QSUB program. Um, so as a matter of fact, you know, all FDA guidance documents are publicly available. Unlike the regulations, they are written in a way that is easy to understand and interpret for someone who does not have a regulatory background. If you have time, you know, they are great to check out uh, because if you are an early stage company or a medical device company, you will need to make sure that you are following all relevant FDA guidance documents as you develop your product. So yeah, next we'll move on to the best practices on how to interact with the FDA. So as you know, um, you know FDA is a pretty big organization, but they are also very mission driven. Their primary focus is to keep the US consumer safe and ensure that only effective medical products are uh, available and delivered to the market. So they are so much mission driven that numerous FDA reviewers deferred their retirements during the COVID pandemic because they understood their important role in keeping the Americans safe. And right now this is causing a small disruption uh, in staffing at the FDA as you know, a lot of people are now finally feeling that it's okay, a good time to, to retire. So the second point here you can see is the FDA is you know, really appreciative of early and frequent conversations. That's because they would like to know what's coming down the pipeline. They also want to provide meaningful guidance early on to help set up studies and testing correctly so that it can provide useful data to be used in a submission later on. We even had uh, FDA Innovation Lab reach out to one of our clients to purchase some of the early research devices for their labs. So the third point here is, you know, it goes without saying that it's important to be professional and respectful in all of communications with the FDA. So their focus is to ensure that you are selling, uh, you know, um, a safe, effective device, and which is, you know, we all want to be on time and productive communication, making sure that your tech is set up without disruptions, you know, making sure that you have well thought out professional meeting agenda uh, during those meetings, and doing so in a professional and respectful manner goes a long way with the FDA. Now, before engaging with the FDA, and the last point here is, you know, you should always consult an FDA guidance and standard documents first, as FDA has a wealth of resources on their website uh, online, which they are expanding on year after year. So likely when you request a feedback, you know, they're going to point you to certain guidances anyways. Um, a regulatory affairs professional or a consultant, you know, they can also help you determine which guidance, you know, are pertinent to your specific type of device as well. So yeah, next we're going to talk about, you know, just general best practices for early stage startups. So on the final note here, you know, if you're planning to eventually sell in the U.S., what we have seen and what has been told also the biggest blunder we see uh, startups make is not to periodically engage with a regulatory professional from the beginning of the device development. Now, this can be a costly mistake since the regulatory professional can help identify early on you know, device designs with easier submission pathways and how to design clinical and non-clinical studies to ensure they are more likely to be accepted by the FDA. Having to repeat these different tests 
are is costly and time consuming and may risk the ultimate point of creating the device, which is to be able to sell to the consumers. Now, one of the things you should get from a regulatory department, if you have one, or from a consultant during your development process is a regulatory strategy report. A strategy report you know, are incredibly useful tools for companies to use during the development process to be able to take a look at the regulatory market and see what appropriate regulatory pathways might be. This helps to get an idea in advance on timeline and costs associated so they can ensure they have a sound path to FDA clearance and approval. A uh, little bit more about, you know, VCs and angel investors, you know, they sometimes require a strategy report and they definitely will give you preference to the companies that have already talked with the regulatory professional about it. They wanna make sure their strategy report is sound as medical device companies are riskier investment considering FDA sign off is usually required. And as we talked before, you know, pre-submissions is a great way to start and interact with the FDA. And it's a great practice to follow as well. And Kristen talked a little more about it before. And lastly, you know, we see which regulatory markets to target first and guidances and global dynamics, you know, it can change country by country. So you have to see what market would fit best uh, for the release of the product once it's approved. So this ends the presentation. I uh, hope it all made sense. Um, and before, you know, we end this presentation, I would like to just talk a little bit more about upcoming conferences we'll be at. Uh, I know a few folks from OBI uh, are attending the Meta conference. So if you're there, you know, let's catch up, uh, say hi. We'll also be at the uh, Device Talks West, which is in Santa Clara. And then we'll be on the panel at the Project MedTech Startup Symposium, which will be in Houston later next month. So with that, I would like to thank you and hope the audience got some good information and high level details of the inner workings of the FDA. I would also like to thank Kristen for leading this presentation. She's an industry expert in uh, regulatory affairs, as well as, um, you know, I'm glad that she was able to talk with you all regarding the process. So hope this lunch and learn session helped you gain some understanding on how the FDA operates uh, and, uh, and how to best engage for a, a sound regulatory strategy forward. And lastly, I'd like to thank Renee and team uh, and the OBI team for hosting this lunch and learn. And yeah, we'll move on to the questions next. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate that. That was a really helpful presentation. A lot of good information. Um, we, I have some questions. Uh, one of the questions uh, just popped into the chat um, regarding the FDA meeting. Um, Kristen mentioned to have some people there from your company. Who on the company side should attend that meeting? Who's important to be there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for FDA pre-submission meetings, when you have a teleconference meeting, or actually if you have any teleconference meeting, even for different types of submissions with the FDA, um, at a minimum, you should have someone from upper management there who understands the direction. Um, you should also have a regulatory point person. Um, and this person is going to run the meeting. They'll have put together a PowerPoint in advance. Um, they'll have discussed with each person what they're going to talk about um, and what should be talked about. And then third of all, you should have your subject matter experts. So people who are experts on the specific questions you are looking to discuss. Um, and depending on the company, you might include other people as well. But really, you want to make sure that they have something that they can contribute um, and they have a reason to be there. Good. Great. Good to know. Good to know. Another uh, question that, um, that I see in the chat is, can you discuss any fees that are associated with 510K and PMA submissions? Yeah, that's a great question. So the FDA posts on their website um, the fees that are associated with each type of submission, um, including um, 510Ks and PMAs. Um, and so this is updated every year based off of um, MADUFMA, uh, which is kind of a, um, a, a negotiation between FDA and industry. 
Um, so the user fees actually came about um, in order to have specific FDA reviewed timelines. Um, so before there were fees for these submissions, um, there was no predictability in how long it would take the FDA to review each of these submissions. Um, so the fees actually came out about in a way um, to ensure metric goals. Um, so the FDA commits to having at least 95 or 99% of these type of submission reviewed in X number of days um, in, a, so, um, in, um, uh, in a trade for um, the fee, um, which goes to paying for um, the reviewers. Um, so this has really helped um, the FDA in order to meet these metrics and for the industry to have consistent timelines. Um, one thing to keep in mind um, as early stage medical device companies, um, you all are, are, are likely small companies, uh, which means you can qualify for the small business rate, uh, which is a significantly subsidized version of the fee. And you can find that online. Um, but usually I think it's at least 70% um, discount. Um, and this is also um, to help promote new innovations and help promote um, new companies um, bring medical devices um, to the market in the U.S. So that's a great program to also consider applying for. Is, the, is that program link available on the FDA site or is there another place to go to look for that? Yeah, I mean, pretty much all of this stuff is very easily Googleable. Um, it's all very well linked in Google, but um, if you look for the FDA um, fees for different types of applications, they'll list both the regular fees and then the small business fees. Um, and then they can uh, provide you with the pathway on how to apply online to be a small business. Well, that's great to know. Thank you. Another question that we have is regarding the de novo submission that you spoke about. Uh, for a de novo submission for a diagnostic, is there a typical number of patients that are needed for the clinical trial? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, and I'm going to use my favorite regulatory word. It really depends. <laughs> um, so it, it depends on what type of study you're doing, um, for what indication, what patient population, um, and that will really determine, um, you need to know, you need, one way you can go about thinking about this is seeing if there's been any other studies done on our market already, um, and see what size they were and how they were powered. Um, but to be honest, this is usually a question that comes up during a pre-submission meeting. So a company may come to, um, an idea of what the number should be and how it should be structured. Um, and then it's usually in the company's best interest to double check that with the FDA through a pre-submission um, before they actually invest a lot of time and money and resources in conducting that clinical study. Yeah, great. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about class 2A for the... Daniel, do you want to just open your mic and ask your question since... Sure, I'm happy to. Yes, go ahead. So we're doing software as a medical device, SAMD, um, for Renee. Um, Thank you. So are all clinical decision support tools going to be in class 2A or is doing something scary like adding a large language model onto that going to change the regulatory environment? And I should probably just submit uh, a Q submission for this, but in your opinion, does that change? Does the software as a medical device always go in class 2A? It depends. So class 3 would be for life-sustaining type of devices and very high-risk devices. So it really depends on your risk profile for your device. You should definitely start by looking at your risk profile and see where it fits, because um, that's the exact same way the FDA is going to kind of walk through it as well. Um, okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah, and the, the best way is also to, again, look online at least as a start um, to see if you've seen any other types of SAMD devices out there that are at all similar that have been cleared. Um, um, also, if you found any that have been approved under a PMA as well. Um, 
So it depends. Great. Uh, another question in the chat is, is there any advantage to seeking the CE mark clearance prior to the FDA clearance? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that's a very pertinent topic right now, because I don't know if you all know, but the medical device regulations in the EU have changed over the last couple of years. So now all currently cleared um, medical devices in Europe have to be recertified under this new uh, regulation called EU MDR. Um, before that they can be sold again. Um, and this is, uh, the timeline was initially 2024, it had to be completed by, but because it's been such a big regulatory overhaul, this has been pushed to 2027 slash 2028, depending on the type of medical device. Um, so that's a huge discussion for a lot of companies right now, um, is should we even bother going to market and, under recertifying under this new regulation in the EU, or should we just go straight to the US? In the past, I will tell you that it was usually preferable to start in Europe, um, especially if you're an international company, and then go to the US, um, because perhaps in some scenarios, um, the review process was slightly less rigorous there. Um, but now it's open for debate. Um, because the um, recertification process is incredibly time consuming right now and incredibly expensive. Um, and there's a lack of reviewers. So we're helping a lot of clients through this process right now. Um, but it's definitely um, some undertaking that should not be taken lightly. Um, so to answer your question, um, we're actually seeing companies start to prefer go to the U.S. Uh, before they go to the EU market, just because there's so much unpredictability with the EU market right now. And Kristen, I would like to add on that, you know, for the CE marking, that would be UK is now accepting that directly right now, right? Yeah, so they're accepting alternative markings as well, um, because... As you know, with Brexit, they have their own, they have to create their own even medical device regulations as well, which they're still trying to figure out and haven't figured it out yet. So in the meantime, they're accepting other countries um, clearances, at least for the next couple of years. Great, great. Good questions. Uh, another question that um, has been asked is, if all the written feedback is clear, do we have to have a teleconference with the FDA? And are there any drawbacks to having that meeting with the FDA? Yeah, so if the feedback is clear, don't have the meeting. Um, it's perfectly acceptable to initially request a meeting um, and then say, hey, we get the feedback. It makes sense to us. We know what to do. Let's cancel the meeting. Um, because um, if you do have the meeting, the FDA is going to come prepared. So just like you, they're going to have all their um, industry experts on the call as well. Their mm -hmm. subject matter experts for biocompatibility, the lead reviewer, potentially uh, a reviewer above the lead reviewer. Um, so they're going to have to prepare and be ready. Um, and if you don't have anything to discuss, they're going to leave it to you to start the conversation. Of course, uh, they're going to be a little disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so um, back to the clinical trial question, how would I know if my device would need a clinical trial for approval? Yeah, so it depends on a, a great way, again, is to kind of start with the regulatory strategy report to see where you fit in the market and see if any comparable companies or devices have needed to do a clinical study. Um, you would need, in general, you would need to do a clinical study if, for example, you have a 510K, but the predicate can't fully ensure safety and effectiveness of the device. So maybe there's a different type of indication or a different component to it that's novel. Um, so that's why often a, a de novo submission will require a clinical study because it is novel, but it's not a high risk device, so it doesn't need the PMA approval pathway. Um, so sometimes a 510K will need one, usually a de novo will need one, and almost always a PMA will need one. 
Um, so usually before a PMA, you do an IVE and then you do a PMA. Um, but yeah, doing a complete review of the market and then kind of seeing where you fit and what you're trying to prove and what you can already prove with previous data, clinical studies for when you need to prove something new. Oh, okay. All right, good. Um, back um, in some earlier slides, one of them mentioned general controls. What is general controls? Yeah, so general controls is a way for the FDA to make sure that the devices you put on market are safe and effective. And that goes for all devices, um, even class one. So this would include things like your registration, your listing with the FDA, making sure your device is not adulterated, which means it has impure components in it, or it has components in it that are not what you say they are. Um, Misbranding would be um, making sure your labeling is compliant um, with re regulations and requirements. So um, you don't say things that are false or misleading on the labeling. Um, you can also, you also need to maintain records for your device. Um, for example, if you needed to do a recall or you needed to do um, any sort of product withdrawal, um, and then usually quality management system and good manufacturing practices as well. Um, so yeah, even if you're a class one device and you don't need um, a 510K or PMA, you don't need the FDA to pre-review your device, there are still a list of things you need to do as a medical device manufacturer in the United States. Okay, great. Um, another question that's come up is, can you give some examples of a humanitarian uh, device or humanitarian exception? Yeah, so... Uh, one example um, I had worked on with a previous company was for a small patient population with a rare disease um, for um, a resorbable type stent. Um, so they had really no um, financial incentive to put it on the market um, because it was such a small group of people who could be treated by it, but they still wanted to put it on the market. So um, the burden of proof was less while they still had to do a lot of um, studies and testing to make sure that the patients they put it in would be safe. Um, they didn't have to prove that it was completely effective. Um, so yeah, one of the parts of the application um, is that you have to prove that you're not going to make monetary benefit off of it. Okay. All right. That's really interesting. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, just pop them into the chat, or if it's easier for you, you can unmute your mic and ask them because we have about um, nine minutes left. Oh, here's a question that came to me just now. How do humanitarian and compassion use differ? Yeah, so this would, these are temporary types of ways to get um, products on the market. Um, so, for example, the COVID tests initially came through during uh, emergency use authorizations, which can be used for that type of public um, outbreaks um, to be able to really get stuff through quickly um, with the hope that it's, it's safe and effective, but maybe not fully proved. Um, that eventually, that needs to be converted to something like a PMA. Um, so it cannot be used under an EAU forever. Um, and then there's a lot of other types of um, special pilot programs and special designations, even more than what's mentioned there, um, that the FDA is continually coming up with. Um, so that's another really important thing. Um, it's useful to consult with regulatory to make sure you're not missing out on those. Um, so, for example, I've had clients who maybe thought, um, a traditional 510K is the right pathway to go, but then we found that there was a special labeling pilot program going on right now. So we were able to cut their review time from 90 days to 30 days under this pilot program, which really saved them two additional months of getting to the market early. Um, so yeah, definitely these programs be out on the watch for because they, they can be really beneficial if they're applicable for your device. Yeah, definitely. And I know quite a few of our client companies use the emergency use authorization with, with their products that yeah. in the past few years. Um, another question is, once a medical device has FDA clearance, can a physician use it for off-target 
indications like they can with drugs off label? Yeah, so it's not the purpose for a physician to use it off label. Um, the purpose of the label is for the physician to use it on label. However, um, as a manufacturer, you can't um, you can't um, hamper with the um, uh, what do you call it? the um, application or uh, the application of medicine by the physician. So if the physician chooses to use it off label for a certain indication, um, that is their um, prerogative. Um, that's their choice. Um, but as a device manufacturer, you definitely can't promote it for off use, off use label, off label use. And if you notice that it is being used off label um, for a significant, for some sort of indication or in a very significant way, um, it's your responsibility to try to correct that, um, whether that be by adding that indication, if you can prove that it's also safe and effective. Um, so that's a route many times manufacturers will go down. They will find through customer complaints or feedback that actually um, this device is really useful for this other area of the body or this other indication. Um, and then that's an evolution that the company needs to go improve it. Um, but yeah, it's the company's responsibility, um, at least in their jurisdiction, to make sure their sales reps aren't promoting it for off-label off use, uh, off use. Oh, great. That's interesting. All right. Any other questions from the audience? Well, thank you, too. This has been a really interesting discussion of a very complex subject. I mean, just all the different acronyms and uh, exceptions and everything out there. It is, um, this is breaking it down for us is really very helpful. Thank you very much. We appreciate your expertise on the subject. Yeah, absolutely. I realize it can get really complicated really quickly. FDA loves their acronyms. So uh, <laughs> half the time I'm in meetings, just acronym A, B, C, D, E. Um, but yeah, if you guys have questions after um, this meeting, feel free to reach out as well. We'd be happy to help. Yes. And uh, it, the program is recorded. I will be sending out the slide deck tomorrow along with a, a link to the recording so that you can rewatch it, you can share it with others, and you can refer back to the slides or reach out to Mattel Consulting if you have any questions at all. Well, okay. I don't think we have any additional questions from the audience. So with that, I'll give you four minutes back. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope Take everybody care. has a great day and I hope to see you at another event very, very soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.